ahead and get started. Um, so actually, I'm going to be talking for half of this, and then Derek Sebastian will be joining at the end and focusing more on um, a specific herbicide tool um, that's kind of newer. Um, so I won't really be focusing on herbicides much, more just some studies where we've used herbicides and learn some really important management implications. So that's what my focus of this talk will be. Um, it's not working, so we'll use this. Sorry, technical so difficulties. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, we've heard about cheatgrass all day. Um, downy brome is also accepted term. So if I say that, or it's on the slide, it's the same exact thing, bromus tectorum. Um, it's what I'll be focusing on. It's what our research here in Colorado has been focused on at CSU. Um, but a lot of our implications go for Medusa head, Ventanata, any invasive winter annual grass. Um, so this is a invasive winter annual grass like we've been talking about all day. Um, one of the reasons it's been able to spread so prolifically through the West is that it exploits moisture and nutrients from our perennial system that's more um, dominated in the West. And so it, because of that niche that it fills, it's been able to get, really get a hold in the West. Um, and then also kind of the focus of this fire science webinar, it you know, accumulates dense fine fuel on the surface and that's what leads to these um, fuels for fires. So there's just a little map showing um, cheatgrass across the U.S. So it does occur in most states, but you can see the Western United States is really solid green, and that's where we focus. It's over 54 million acres as of the last survey, um, so that's really widespread. That doesn't include Bentonada or Medusa head acres. Um, those are a little bit harder to get a for sure acre uh, basis on, um, but when you add that in, it's more than 54 million acres. So a lot of times we like to ask, has the battle been lost? With 54 million acres, where do you start? Um, so I'm hoping today I can share some different management implications we've learned at CSU from doing studies on cheatgrass and say that the battle hasn't been completely lost. There's still areas we can definitely save um, and restore. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go through a brief introduction, but these are kind of repeats because with four speakers before, um, they've gone through this, but um, it's really the reason we're so focused on these invasive annual grasses is that they're transforming our, especially our western rangelands, on a landscape scale. Um, they're really impacting our native ecosystem. So obviously fire hazard, we focused on that all day, um, but also decrease uh, diversity and productivity in our native ecosystems. Um, and then we just had uh, some great talks on this. Uh, displaced and decreased wildlife um, due to fire, but also due to just um, expansion of these invasive grasses replacing vegetation that wildlife uses. Um, so what I'm going to focus on for this first part is a really cool study that we did at CSU looking at um, the soil seed bank and managing the soil seed bank. This is uh, cheatgrass in this example. Um, I'm not sure if there's this work has been done for Medusa head or Ventanata yet. Um, but what we did was we had some treatments we put out in the field and we used, um, there's my stuff, um, glyphosate and we either had um, no treatment of glyphosate, we used glyphosate for one year and this is just purely to burn down the cheatgrass when it had all germinated um, to prevent it from going to seed that year. So then anything the next year that came back without a glyphosate treatment would be purely from the soil seed bank. Um, so this is how we tested that theory. So glyphosate wouldn't be a management recommendation. It was more to just test this concept of how long does the soil seed bank persist. Um, so we did it for one to five years. Um, so it either got one application through five applications. Um, and then at the end of that, we took soil cores and grew those up in the greenhouse. Um, we also collected biomass in the field every year to see the return of the cheatgrass depending on the number of applications. Um, so this is what we found um, from our yearly biomass collections. With one application, uh, we reduced that cheatgrass almost down um, to zero, uh, but the next year it was right back up to 
um, almost the level of the non-treated plaque. With two years, um, we reduced it for two years in a row. That second year, we reduced that biomass to zero. Um, and then that third year, you can see it came back just from the soil seed bank, 50% compared to the non-treated um, biomass came back. But by year five, it was back to levels that were comparable to the non-treated. Three years, we see the same story. Um, we have a giant jump. So three years of management, we're not letting it go to seed. So we're not adding to the soil seed bank. Um, but if you stop management after that third year, um, it jumps, it jumped right back up. So at five years, we're back to the non-treated level. It was really at four years or five years of an application or a management strategy where you see the soil seed bank reduced down and you're not getting cheatgrass coming back from the soil seed bank. Um, I think this is one of the most important studies we've done on cheatgrass at CSU because that shows you that when we have one year of management, and I think Matt Germino even said this at the beginning, um, a lot of times it's one application, um, but we need repeated management measures or adaptive management is what he said. And that's a great point. We really do need adaptive management um, for three plus years to manage that soil seed bank. So that either means a product that's going to get you through three plus years um, or a control or some sort of management or repeated measures every year until you get through that soil seed bank persistence. Um, so then we collected those cores at the end. Um, just to show the point, we took them back to the greenhouse and grew out those soil cores from each spot, um, each application. So we have one through three years in this picture. You can see all the cheap grass came back in from that soil that we took. So it's still in the soil. But if we had four or five years of application, it's not coming back. And actually some of this green grass in the picture here is um, perennial grasses coming back. So our perennial grass seeds can be much longer lived than our annual grass seeds. And that's a really, that's a benefit for managing these invasive annual grasses because they are shorter lived. Um, so five years, you get soil seed bank completion. So again, the conclusion is that it's a multi-year approach to managing the soil seed bank and actually um, getting rid of cheatgrass in an area. And with that, you get quick decomposition of the fine fuel that presents the fire risk. And so um, this is just, you can see an untreated area here, and then an area that was treated with herbicide and just one year after treatment, that litter is actually broken down. Now there's different um, numbers on that for Medusa and Bentonata. We don't quite know how long it takes to break down. Um, I've heard it can break down that quick or it can be longer lived, but either way you need a treatment that persists so you do get that breakdown of the fuel. Otherwise, all this regrowth is adding back to the fuel source. So then another study we kind of did at CSU looking at long-term cheatgrass management. And so I'm gonna, we did do herbicides. I'm not gonna focus too much on the herbicides in this, but more what we saw with the perennial grass and forb response. So we had a site um, with three different um, invasive annual species. So cheatgrass, um, but we also had Japanese brome and then feral rye, which is a problem in our area. And I think it's starting to spread a lot more. Looked at different application timings we compared a newer product, Esplanade, um, versus Plateau, which is a commonly used product on invasive winter annuals. Um, so two years after treatment, um, we we're actually getting almost 100% control with especially those higher rates of Esplanade. Um, well, at that point in time, Plateau had already broke and was providing really limited control. I'm just going to show that slide to show you the perennial grass response in comparison to the control we were getting. Um, ooh, uh, when we look at perennial grass response, um, especially on that higher level or rate of esplanade, we had over an eightfold increase. So you can see in the check plot, we have about 100 pounds per acre of perennial grasses. Um, plateau, which provided, didn't provide that two years of control. We see a little bit of increase in perennial grass but it's really where we provided that two years of management, two plus years 
we see the perennial grass just respond and um, you know, over 1,700 pounds per acre of perennial grass in this situation. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Forb response also, we saw the same thing. So over a five-fold increase in, in forbs, um, which is just really amazing in two years to see that level of response. So this is just showing us um, the study is so great for some management implications. Because if you can control those invasive grasses, you can see responses like this in not a lot of uh, a lot of time, just two years time, we're seeing really a take back of the ecosystem. Of course, this area did have a native understory present, um, but it was highly invaded. You can see from the level and the check plots um, how much really existed there, but it was able to get a hold um, and compete and provide some competition against future invasion. Um, and then this is really cool too. At the same site, we see species richness going from about four unique, this is just four species, but four unique four species in the non-treated to eight species in the, the treated plots. And so we're actually seeing an increase in diversity in the plots that we're treating. And this is again, just in two years time, which is pretty amazing because uh, sometimes we think restoration can take so long, but we might've been going about it the wrong way um, in past restoration efforts. This is just a picture of that site that I was talking about. Um, so you can see on the left is the cheatgrass Japanese brome invaded area and um, left side of that picture is the non-treated and you can see the release of um, the perennial ecosystem in the treated area. And I'm just going to go through one more study, um, especially focusing again on those perennial grass increases. Um, but this we just looked at a variety of herbicide combinations. I'm not going to focus on them um, too much. I'm mostly just going to show what happened in the area. Um, but those in blue included Esplanade, which is a cheatgrass herbicide, and we're seeing long-term control with it. You'll hear more about it in the next part of this talk. And you can see 19 months after treatment, um, we get kind of a flip-flop. At first, we don't get quite 100% control. This is a pre-emergent herbicide. Um, so it picks up the next year's germination in 19 months after treatment. We're seeing almost 100% across the board on all the Esplanade treatments for cheatgrass control. Um, I say this to show this slide here, our perennial grass biomass. Um, so I don't want to just show one site for biomass increase. So this is a second site. We see the same thing, a five-fold increase. That's quite a bit. We're going from about 500 pounds an acre to almost, or sorry, this is in kilograms per hectare to um, 3,000 kilograms per hectare in this case with those treatments that provided that 19 months. So this is just in 19 months, less than two years of cheatgrass control. Um, but what I think is more impressive is pictures. Um, so there's the picture of that site. So you can see before this is taken from pretty much the same angle, what it looked like before and what it looks like after. Um, there's a lot of Western wheatgrass at that site it really released it and, um, and started to come back in. And you can see that ecosystem can be really resilient to invasion at this point because there's not, because um, it's healthy, it's competitive against future reinvasions of cheatgrass. I'm just gonna finish up my section with a few more large scale photos of restoration and what we've seen when you can manage cheatgrass for more than one year. Um, so I, the biggest thing for my presentation today is that you're decreasing that fire risk. And so this is actually a feral rye invasion, but another winter annual grass that we deal with. And you can see the left side of that fence, um, how much fuel that would provide for a fire if a fire got started there, where the right side was treated. Um, and those, that perennial forbs and grasses all came back that wasn't seeded, that just came back from the seed bank. And you can see how that could, uh, the, a fire wouldn't be as likely to spread through there, it would spread a lot quicker. Again, another, um, this was actually put out as a fire break on this property. So you can see the non-treated side and how much fuel is there. Um, and then just 29 months after treatment, um, what that left side of the fence looks like with the release of the perennial forbs and grasses and how that's gonna be more resilient in a fire. And then 
Derek will take over and talk about a new tool um, for managing sheet rest. Thanks, Shannon. Um, yeah, my name is Derek Sebastian. I'm with the Bayer Stewardship and Development Team uh, for the Western U.S. with Dr. Harry Quick, and I had the opportunity to work on my PhD and Master's at CSU on um, a new herbicide tool for kind of that long-term control aspect, um, so Esplanade. And you know, Shannon really talked about you know the seed bank depletion is really the key. The more we've seen with these invasive annual grasses, is getting that three, four, five years of control is really critical to the success of your restoration um, project. And so what we've seen is that, you know, whether that be burning herbicides, you know, we've mentioned a lot of different tools throughout this presentation. Um, s one is just another tool that could be added to your tool belt for that long-term control aspect. Um, and I'll present on, you know, the potential of treating one time and getting that three to four years control with one treatment. Um, and so this was uh, the research that we did at CSU with Dr. Scott Nissen. Um, and I'll kind of go off of um, from there. We've we've kind of expanded the project in Colorado uh, to now 12 western states, and we've targeted basically the key invasive winter annual grasses that we've been talking about throughout this presentation: um, the triple threat cheatgrass, Ventanata, Medusa head, uh, kind of the key players, um, kind of in in you know for this symposium. But there's also a spread of a lot of different other invasive annual grasses, um, depending on the location in the western U.S. that we're talking about. And I kind of want to give just a background on Esplanade because we'll have some, you know, a lot of different trials for the university update. So just want to give some background on how the herbicide works and what we've found over uh, the past uh, six, seven years doing this development work. Uh, so Esplanade is a cellulose biosynthesis inhibitor, uh, which is long for it's a root inhibitor, basically. So as uh, the new cheatgrass, medusa head or ventanata seedlings begin to emerge, um, it basically stops, you know, the roots from growing as, as soon as they begin to germinate. And here's a schematic we did in the lab showing that as you increase the herbicide concentration uh, from left to right, you see that root inhibition over the increasing rates. And that's the same for cheatgrass, feral rye in this study, as well as uh, broadleaf weeds, kochia. Uh, so we do have activity on, on a suite of broadleaf weeds as well. And you asked, so what, you know, it's, it's good if you can get that long-term control aspect, but what are the um, implications on the native plant community? And that's really where the probably the most exciting part of this project has been is, is seeing the uh, selectivity of this herbicide on the native perennial plants, whether that be forbs, grasses, or shrubs. And you'll see here a schematic of kind of how the selectivity works. So it's based on position of the herbicide in the soil. So it binds to the soil particles and the organic matter, and it stays where that red, those red circles are in the top soil profile. And you have your perennial roots, your established perennials with your native grasses, forbs, and shrubs that have roots well below that herbicide zone. And so the selectivity comes based on where those invasive annual grasses are germinating from and where the perennial root system lies. And we'll show some more photos, and you saw some from Shannon, uh, showing the selectivity on those uh, native species. And we've done a lot of um, native tolerance work as well that I think Scott will present on. I wanted to talk a little bit about the different application or the different timings of application. And so Shannon mentioned that it's a pre-emergence herbicide, so it does not have post-emergence activity on the invasive annual grasses. And so basically you can apply as a pre-emergent, as you can see here on the top, and you can do Esplanade from, you know, the five to seven ounces per acre rate. And the recommendation, because there is, like we've been talking about, that really thick thatch layer, it's important to get moisture after application to get that into the soil zone where the invasive annual grasses are germinating from. And so basically, you know, we recommend one to two months um, before expected germination of the invasive annual grass. And so for Colorado and some of the other Western states, for this year, it'd be kind of that June, July time frame with the expected germination in August, September. Uh, so a good one to two months before. Uh, the other option as well, so you'll see these really high thatch areas, you know, that these invasive annual grasses accumulate over time. And so you'll, you'll notice that in the extremely high thatch layers, there's a possibility like Shannon showed in the first graph, that you may see some escapes the first year based on when you did your application and how much moisture you had before germination. And so it's you know critical to get moisture to get into the soil. And uh, an option too is to add a water soluble tank mix partner, such as Plateau or Matrix to that pre-emergence herbicide. And so the key with that is really go out early, as early as you possibly can. Um, and, and we have a great video that didn't actually load up on the computer that's shown uh, there's a difference between germination and emergence. And so a lot of times germination occurs well before you even see it above soil. So you could get 
basically a one to two inch root growth below soil before you even see it above soil. So if you see it above soil at your pre-emergence application, you're way too late for that timing and you'll see escapes that year. So that's why it's critical to go out as early as possible on that. Uh, the other option, there's the video, I wish it played, but it does not. Uh, the other option is a post-emergent application. And this is when your native perennials are dormant. So they're fully dormant uh, in the winter time and you use a post-emergent product such as glyphosate, matrix, plateau, or Lambient, and you take mix that with Esplanade. So basically you have the post-emergent product to control what's germinated, and then Esplanade will carry you through the second, third, fourth year. So that's the idea behind that. And in, in terms of current labeling, uh, it's labeled for uh, non-crop areas such as parks and open spaces, wildlife management areas, recreation areas, fire rehab, prairies, and fire breaks. So no uh, graze sites currently. Um, the um, the grazing tolerance bears working on the grazing tolerance and um, as expected, um, everything's on track to submit to EPA by the end of the year. And so then EPA has a, um, a review period after that, but uh, on track right now to submit to the end of the year. Um, and I say here, not grazed except, we do have a section 18 in Wyoming, uh, which is an emergency exemption for, it's actually a statewide exemption to use Esplanade on Medusa Head and Ventanada uh, throughout the state of Wyoming on grazed areas with a two-week grazing restriction. And Montana and Utah have also submitted for Section 18. And so kind of going back to what Shannon was alluding to, so the key is really that long-term control aspect and depleting the seed bank. And so, you know, it's kind of the question, you know, what if? Have we lost the battle? I really don't think we have. We just haven't at times approached it in the right way or, or looked at it through this kind of seed bank um, realm. So really the key is getting that long-term control, which gives you the opportunity to deplete the seed bank, which is like Shannon talked about, you know, extremely important. And this is a schematic um, just kind of demonstrating what we we're talking about here. Uh, so the right-hand side of the screen, you see basically a non-treated area. And basically you see all the seedlings coming back. You see some of the desirable perennials underneath and you see the thatch layer, you know, the, that fine fuel fire hazard. On the left-hand side was sprayed with Esplanade 17, 18 months prior to this uh, photo. And you don't see those seedlings coming back. You see that thatch layer, like Shannon mentioned, has decomposed entirely. So that, that fine fuel is, is degraded. And you see the response of the native uh, perennial plants based on the position of that herbicide in the topsoil profile. And so this is kind of a schematic of what we're talking about there. And then, so depleting the seed bank leads to a suite of, of a lot of different um, you know, ecosystem restoration potential. So your fine fuels reduction, uh, like we heard about, you know, decreasing the fire frequency intensity, increasing wildlife habitat, pollinator habitat, and then really reestablishing those native plants. And then a few, few slides just based on, um, and, and we talked about this with some other speakers today on, you know, really prioritizing the sites that you choose to treat. And so, you know, restoration is a difficult and expensive task. It's dependent on a lot of different factors, you know, not only long-term control, the weather. Um, and so, you know, it's really important to prioritize some of the sites that still have the remnant native perennial plants still intact. Um, there's, you know, definitely those ongoing restoration projects that are critical, but I think if, if we were all to evaluate potential sites for prioritizing, I think we all have these areas that are um, not completely invaded and still have that remnant native understory which I think is really, you know, where we should target our first um, restoration. Um, this is a, an example of that. So this is actually gonna be on the uh, field tour tomorrow. This is Rabbit Mountain Open Space in Boulder County, Colorado. And this is really an example of this ecosystem restoration that we're talking about. So really depleting the seed bank, you know, decreasing that fuel load. Um, and then, yeah, really managing the seed bank is the key. And you can see here, this is a non-treated area. You see all the cheap grass and you'll see some kind of scattered uh, perennial grasses and forbs. And then I'll flip here to the treated area. And I took this photo about a week ago and you can see the response of the natives after the treatment. So once you relieve, you know, the stress of those invasive annuals, you know, depleting the moisture and nutrients, they're able to, you know, utilize that and, and recover. And that's where that ecosystem restoration fits in. And then last slide again is I think really prioritizing your site. So there are a lot of sites like this, you know, EDRR is hard to, you know, kind of think about with cheatgrass because it's so widespread. But a lot of, you know, land managers, federal, state, you know, private landowners have these sites that 
are either recently invaded or still have intact perennial natives. And I think that's really, you know, the key is to target these areas first, um, in addition to some of the rebeds, but I think this is where we have the, the greatest likelihood of success in the future. So um, with that, that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so we have three. <laughs> do this, but we lined them up on the desktop. Okay. <coughs> so and show. And show. Oh, great. Okay. Screen sharing has been stopped since the show the news. Uh oh. Well, maybe Paul has up. Come on. I'm glad you know what you're doing. This one? No, this guy. No, that's Sebastian. Chris. Here, let her. So just that. Oh, oh, sorry, it's the next one. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, I couldn't drag it. Hold on, online folks. We're uh, getting the next um, speaker up. Of course, not on my phone. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thanks for your patience while we get the next presentation up. We'll have Dr. Scott Nissen from Colorado State University talk about a research update in cheatgrass control. And if the other speakers in the room can be ready to, to come up um, a minute before your, uh, the predecessor is finished, that would be great. And we have one uh, remote guy, Dr. Corey Ransom. It looks good on our end. We just, as soon as you get into presentation mode, yep. And swap. And Scott, what, uh, you tell the folks at home what department you're with? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm with the Department of Bioagricultural Sciences and Pest Management, which doesn't really mean anything, and that's why we're having a, a big discussion these days about what our name should be. Um, but anyway, to, to make a long story short, I know that people who are from the government or from universities always have a little bit of a, an issue or anxiety when, when we include uh, a lot of industry people who come and talk about a single product. But what I want to make the point of is that this has actually been driven more by the university trying to drive bear, uh, bear crop science and get this company interested in a product that we knew uh, from research that was started in 2010 had tremendous potential to help us manage a lot of these uh, winter annual invasive weeds. And I'll just mention a short story, which is uh, a little bit of uh, patting myself and others here at CSU on the back. But uh, when Bayer launched this product that Derek's referred to as Esplanade, it was originally launched as Allion, which was a, a herbicide for use in in uh, tree and, and nut crops, so it was released in California. And the label very clearly stated that cheatgrass was one of those species that was highly susceptible uh, to Allian. To so came back from that meeting, talked to one of our research associates, uh, Jim Sebastian, uh, about the potential for using a herbicide that, that was a whole different paradigm. Uh, Derek talked about this idea that the herbicide is providing selectivity by placement in the soil rather than relying on physiological differences uh, in activity. And that opened a whole new uh, way of looking at management. So this has really been driven by us going to Bayer and saying, hey, you have a product that could really help in, in this kind of management scheme and really encourage them for doing things like spending the money to get a grazing label and all those kinds of things. So, those are not trivial inputs from the standpoint of, of industry, 
but I think you'll, you've seen from this work that we, that the potential is really there to help um, with all these invasive uh, grass issues. What does it not want to shift? Can I go that way? So if there's a problem, see at the top it says swap displays. You want to click that. Yeah, uh, there you go. That one? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, um, in Colorado, we also have a, another, uh, this just shows uh, all the different sites where we've explored this potential use of Esplanade for winter annual grass control. And um, as Derek mentioned, we're looking at eleva elevational effects, you know, high rainfall, uh, short growing season, long growing season, that sort of thing. Places where downy brome actually acts as a summer annual rather than a winter annual. And, and we've got now about 30 or so sites out of across Colorado looking at all these different environments. And we have one real advantage here um, in Colorado, and that's the fact that we have these open spaces that are managed at the county level. So we're not talking about areas that are grazed extensively by livestock, but those areas which are made available to citizens of the state for mountain biking and hiking and bird watching and all these sort of things that are not dependent on domestic livestock. So that's given us an opportunity to explore how uh, Esplanade fits into all these restoration programs without having to, to deal with the fact that the product does not have a, a label for grazing. So this is just a, an overview of a lot of the different partners that we've worked with over the last uh, five or six years to, to explore the impacts of endazaflam not only on um, wind annual grasses, but also on the impact of native species. So this, as I mentioned, this work started in 2010. So that was shortly after Esplanade was, was um, actually marketed in that other market that I mentioned in California on trees and nuts. We put out a couple of different sites, a bunch of different timings to see how it fit in. So we had a sort of a pre-emergence, early post, and then something that would be applied like right before the natives started to uh, to come out of dormancy. We looked at all the standard cheatgrass herbicides and then Esplanade was thrown in there with and without glyphosate mainly because as Derek mentioned, glyphosate, or Esplanade really doesn't have any or very, very little post-emergence activity. And what we found, and I've kind of shortened this down to the third year of the study. So this is three years after application in two different environments. And what we found is that, in, that the two tank mixes that included Esplanade we're still providing better than 85 or 90% control three years after application. So that was a pretty exciting uh, finding when we compared it to what we've normally been dealing with, with matrix and with plateau, which were kind of the standards. Um, and if you look at, you know, pictures are, are really important for, for emphasizing the points that you, you don't really achieve when you're looking at just uh, raw numbers, but Here's the untreated on the one side that shows still a, a site that has some native grass cover, but is still being highly invaded by cheatgrass. And on the other side, uh, a reasonably low rate actually of Esplanade three years after treatment. And you see it still looks pretty, uh, pretty clean. And we're, you know, all these open spaces are, are those niches that should be there, be there in a bunch grass environment, but are highly in, invadable by cheatgrass um, because that's an open niche. So then we took the data from that original work along with some other work that we did subsequently and published it in the Journal of Rangeland Ecology and Management to try to make others aware that this was a potential uh, new uh, idea or a new way of looking at winter annual grass management. And so I think we've had pretty good response to that, um, that publication. And we followed it up with probably three or four other publications looking at a variety of aspects of, of uh, winter annual grass control. But when you present this kind of information to ecologists or to groups of range managers, the question always comes up, you know, what's the impact on native species? Because that's, you're talking about a, a product that has both grass and broadleaf activity. So the question is, well, what's it gonna do to native forbs? So that's been a lot of what uh, 
what Shannon has been focusing on for her PhD is trying to, to develop some idea. Are we really going to be sure we can control the winter annual grasses, but are we really having any potential impact on uh, native forbs because they're a very important part of, of the ecosystem, obviously. So we put together a little study to look at that a couple of places in Colorado. One of them actually happens to be within sight of the Coors Brewery, which can make it a little difficult on a hot day. Uh, it gets a little thirsty as you're looking out at this big Coors sign uh, off in the distance. <clears throat> but we had two sites that had very diverse um, uh, four bunder stories, and we put together a bunch of treatments, some including Esplanade, some without Esplanade, some that would provide broadleaf weed control like Tordon and Method, and uh, tank mixes of those with Esplanade, and, and from there we, we realized that um, it would give us a good idea about how these two groups of herbicides interacted uh, on the native forb community. And if we just looked at cheatgrass cover, well, you know, it's the same story we've seen with all the other treatments that included Esplanade. Where we had Esplanade, especially at the five and seven ounce rate, a couple years after treatment, we're getting nearly 100% re reduction in cheatgrass cover. <clears throat> and in those sites where we didn't, where we had plateau or just used um, uh, something like Tordon or Method, which really don't have any grass activity, then of course the cheatgrass cover was really high. And you can see from this next slide that um, in those sites where we had Esplanade, we were able to get a pretty nice response of, of native forbs. And actually, I'll show you the data from the next slide. Um, this is some principal component analysis. This is from, will be a chapter in Shannon's thesis. She was kind enough to let me use her data. But you can see the, the one principal component shows that the first year of the study, the first year after application, that you see that all the treatments that included just Esplanade um, were very similar in species diversity to the untreated check. And we saw that those herbicides that have potential activity on, on broad leaves like Tordon and Method um, those were significantly or statistically different from the other treatments. But then as you go a year later, now you start to see those two groups converge, which means while we might reduce some of the native forbs with some of those broadleaf treatments, we don't necessarily eliminate them entirely from the, uh, from the ecosystem. And over time, they, they will hopefully slowly come back into the, to the system. Okay. So what, do, what does it mean for, for these reclamations and, and the advantage we have here in Colorado with so many acres of open space? And this just gives you sort of an overview of how many different groups we're collaborating with to try to get this uh, to be more of a broad scale approach. Um, places like cities, uh, counties, um, NRCS and other groups, Fish and Wildlife, um, the parks and recreation here in Colorado, which has recently been changed. Uh, Boulder County open space, Larimer County uh, getting bear involved as well. So this just shows you the kind of uh, groups that we're trying to put together to look at all these winter annual grasses. And now uh, a couple of obligatory pictures to show beautiful wildflowers. This is Cope. This is a site in Boulder County where we treated for downy brome and Japanese brome. Um, Seven months after treatment, you can see the release of the natives. And it's pretty impressive, especially if you get a year when you just have, we don't need even the high levels of rainfall. We just need average rainfall to get these uh, releases. And in even some years that have been really dry, we've been able to see some pretty nice responses. Um, Ruth Roberts is another site where we've done a lot of work controlling uh, a mixture of winter annual grasses, downy brome, Japanese brome, and feral rye. And you can see from the response, prairie cone flower and lots of other native forbs have come back in those sites uh, compared to the untreated, which is shown below. And I'll end on this slide because it's one of those that you could look at for a long time <clears throat> because it really shows you the potential that we're looking at uh, with a product like Espl Esplanade and how it fits into a lot of different management scenarios. 
And as Derek mentioned, especially if we're looking at prioritizing, any area where we have a pretty good native understory uh, with forbs and native grasses, we've seen some tremendous responses, which just shows you, you know, the impact that these winter annual grasses are having by utilizing the, the one really limiting resource, which is moisture. And we've gone 2015 here in the front range was above average and then 16 and 17 have been about 50% lower than our, our 50 year average or 30 year average. So um, when you have that kind of variability in rainfall, that moisture becomes extremely critical and anything you can do to conserve that and make it available to the native species, the better the, better the community is gonna be able to to have resilience and sustainability. And I'm done. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Nissen. That was great, wonderful photos. Um, Thank you, Shannon, for folks. Uh, we're gonna uh, bring up the, fix the display and bring up the next, um, presentation. Next is Dr. Ian Burke from Washington State University and will speak on Ventanata control. And while we're waiting for the display, uh, Dr. Burke, do you want to tell us what department you're affiliated with? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm in the uh, Crop and Soil Science Department at Washington State University. I've uh, been there, uh, I think, for about as long as Ventanata has been in Washington, uh, or at least been noticed as a problem in Washington. Uh, and we've only just really begun to work with indazoflam or esplanade in our non-crop areas. We don't have the maturity of, of large-scale plots that uh, Colorado State has, has stewarded. So I'm going to mostly be talking about a uh, single trial and uh, hopefully give you some of my thoughts and a little bit of background on vetinata biology. Uh, a lot of this work we've been doing has been in collaboration with uh, Tim Prather. Prather's really more the expert. This is uh, a weed that he's really taken up as one of his uh, program emphases. Uh, and then sometimes I just kind of ride along. Yep. But in this instance, we had a, a nice uh, tight little trial positioned by Bayer that allowed us to really get a good sense for what indazoflam or esplanade is going to do for us. There we go. Very good. Thanks very much. Looks like we're set. Hmm. Uh, and, I, you know, Washington, uh, Eastern Washington in, partic in particular is a unique landscape. If you've never been to the Palouse, I highly encourage a visit. Uh, it's probably one of the most scenic landscapes. Uh, although I recognize I'm standing in Denver, Colorado, <laughs> or, or at least in, in Colorado. Uh, what we have is this uh, homogamation of uh, multi-use uh, patterns in the in the particularly what we call the high rainfall zone of Eastern Washington. We're a Mediterranean climate and we have uh, most of our rainfall falls between November and May. And uh, we have very deep lust deposits of uh, soil and, and we grow uh, some of the highest yielding winter wheat in the world, dry land. And uh, right next to that, we have ultra low value CRP. And the management philosophies between the two are quite different, of course. Uh, but functionally, what's, what's, that's, what's happened has we've facilitated this large uh, reservoir open space for invasion by uh, annual grass species, first by downy brome and, and then by ventanata. Uh, in fact, ventanata, where it does occur, outcompetes the downy brome and displaces it. Uh, and that's what was one of my first lessons in, in managing it. So in my own twisted warped mind, I had thought of, well, we could just use Ventanata to displace, displace the downy brome and then kill the Ventanata, right? Uh, and maybe there's still a, a use for that crazy hypothesis. Uh, so in terms of a range uh, for Ventanata, as other uh, present presenters have indicated, there's not really a good consensus on where it's found. We know that there's some incipient populations uh, being observed in relatively wet sites in the sagebrush steppe in southern Idaho and adjacent Oregon. Uh, but for us in the Pacific Northwest, particularly around the Pullman area and in that high rainfall zone, we tend to think of that as, as the densest uh, 
area of Ventanata invasion. In fact, it's hard to find a spot, a roadside, a non-crop area where, you, where there isn't Ventanata now uh, in much of the Palouse. Uh, it doesn't seem to have moved very far west. There seems to be a very strong climb developing. Uh, it, it appears to be related to moisture, as most things are in the west, uh, but it looks like it might be adapting and moving west, and so we're keeping a close eye on it. It was also just recently declared a class C noxious weed, so uh, uh, there's recognition, at least in Olympia, that this is a significant problem. It's a, a winter annual, but it's not uh, particularly closely related to the other invasive winter annuals uh, that we deal with. And I think that's somewhat clattered our mindset and how we think about management. It's in the Avena tribe. It's closely related to wild oat. In fact, it responds quite well to wild oat herbicides. Uh, so these days, when growers ask me about it, how do I manage this weird winter annual? I said, wait, and we've tried all the downy brome herbicides and they don't really work all that well. So, well, you're thinking about it wrong. What if I called it winter annual wild oat? And the light comes on. Everyone knows about wild oat and how to deal with that. Uh, but it, where it does occur, it really um, displaces uh, a lot of grass species uh, and the forbs. It appears to do so through uh, prolific use of water early in the season to the, to the detriment of everything else around it, uh, even including downy brome. Uh, as Matt indicated in the first presentation, it has very low um, use as a, a forage. Uh, it's very unpalatable. It's got very high silica content. And uh, there's a lot of hypotheses about why it all of a sudden has become invasive. We've, know, we've known it's been present here in the PNW uh, since the 1950s. It's just been there. And then all of a sudden, in the last decade and a half, it's really become quite a problem. Uh, we've thought maybe it might be a ploidy doubling, um, which we know can increase competitiveness. Uh, I've heard uh, uh, fungal endophytes posed as a hypothesis, uh, mycorrhizal associations, allelopathy. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know if there's been any really good evidence about why it seems to be all of a sudden a big problem other than maybe perhaps there might be some heterosis going on. And some of the populations that were existent finally uh, were able to outcross a little bit and produce something a little bit more adapted. No one really knows. Uh, but in terms of biology, it all seems to be um, pretty similar. Germination usually occurs in the fall, usually after when we think about when downy brome germinates, uh, usually at the first rainfall. Uh, and that can be quite variable these days. Uh, usually uh, by mid to late October, we've had something, but often sometimes we don't get it until early November, and then it starts to germinate. Uh, in some really good experiments, uh, Dr. Prather uh, quantified the sole seed bank longevity at something like about 49 months, although that was highly dependent upon depth of burial. Uh, too deep, and it was not persistent at all. It really likes to live in that very shallow uh, duff layer and, and just uh, in that adjacent soil. So it really doesn't tolerate burial at all. So this is a, a picture of my first experience with Vetinata. In, in the spring of 2008, I had a, a graduate student, this my, one of my first graduate students, uh, put out some plots on what we call uh, degraded Palouse Prairie. Uh, there's not a lot of Palouse Prairie left. It's all been displaced by farming and, and uh, invasive annual weeds. But what is left is, is pretty neat to work in. Uh, it's a pretty diverse ecosystem, dominated primarily by forbs. And we put it out, this little trial, in an effort to do a little bit of downy brome management. I, I was new to the West, and I really had no idea what I was dealing with when it, come, when it came to downy brome. And so we put a little trial out to learn. And we went out and raided it in the spring. And I, I remember the phone call very distinctly. Uh, Dr. Burke, I don't think this is downy brome. Uh, you know, you go up to these sites, they're high elevation sites, and you spray it. It looks like a little tiny annual grass. Uh, maybe it's just emerged. Sometimes it hasn't even emerged when you put these plots out. So you don't know until the spring what you might have. And this is what we came back to, a, a site completely degraded and overwhelmed by Ventanata. And it's the tiniest little annual grass in these ecosystems. Uh, compared to downy brome, it, it looks just minute. Uh, it doesn't produce a lot of above ground biomass. Uh, but what it does produce is, is a lot of seed. Each, each little plant uh, can produce you know, 30, 50 seed, and it's pretty dense where it does occur. Uh, the other lesson we learned as part of that uh, little project, we had some old holon left over. It's old wheat herbicide that we used initially to control downy brome. That's diclofop, and we also used peroxalam. And in each instance, we achieved excellent control. 
it's related to wild oat. These are both excellent wild oat products. Uh, so there are options here for management of Danny Brown um, outside of the one I'm going to just sort of focus on today. So uh, the focus of the, the two studies I'll discuss today were, um, you know, these two studies were located uh, about 25 miles apart, uh, one in Moscow, Idaho, just to the east of Moscow, uh, and one in Pullman, uh, just to the west of Pullman. And they had some unique differences. One had three applications, one had four, uh, but by, by and large, they were about the same with the exception of application date. Uh, and this is uh, some um, really, it's really sort of important to, to keep in mind as I go through this data. So in Pullman, uh, we applied the herbicide in February, late February, and in Moscow, the site, that application didn't happen until late March something like um, 250 groin degree days separated the two applications. That's a significant amount of heat thermal units can stimulate germination. Uh, the treatments are pretty simple. Uh, these are in uh, SI units. Um, and I think I've actually managed to switch the two, uh, switch the two rates here for the rim sulfur round, but for the most part, they're um, about the same. So. This would be the equivalent of five ounces of midazoplan of esplanade and seven ounces of esplanade. Oh, this Macintosh is driving me crazy. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, otherwise, we had some comparison treatments. We had rimsulfuron um, and then com um, mixtures of, of midazoplan and rimsulfuron and then a comparison treatment to a mazepic and something like a positive control in glyphosate applied post emergence to the, uh, to the site. And then we went back and took cover measurements. Um, and uh, we did that over a couple of years and separate everything into different cover classes. So I'll be talking about cover, not percent control here. These are, um, uh, they're somewhat distinct and different. So the first slide uh, shows cover in 2016 at the two different sites. There was a, a site, uh, a location by year interaction, uh, largely related to uh, the density of that not found in some of the non-treated controls. Uh, but also related to that difference in application timing. Uh, so uh, when we went out and rated cover later in the season, and these, would, these uh, cover ratings happened in late June and early August, you know, in, in the PNW that doesn't matter, no right significant rain call all occurred between those two dates. Nothing changed on these sites. Uh, so we can pretty much go out and do it. Whatever, everything's drying down, it's all um, fuel for fires. So we will rate really just about any time between June and, and August. <clears throat> and uh, we observed some interesting things. So glyphosate um, really didn't help us regardless of, of location, uh, managing of the management of the ventanata. Uh, when we applied uh, glyphosate plus indazoflam, uh, regardless of rate at the Moscow site, we didn't see uh, really a, a measurable in, improvement of control but what, clearly what we were seeing is a difference in cover between uh, these treatments and the glyphosate applied by itself, which indicated to us that perhaps Ventanata was continuing to germinate, or at least it was covered in a duff layer um, and was small enough. Potentially what we're seeing <clears throat> too is Esplanade is uh, reaching back on the, on the um, Ventanata, which is somewhat exciting to see. By reach back, I mean it's capable of managing um, emerged uh, seedlings of the ventanata. Get my species right. <clears throat> At the, in the second year, in terms of cover, we observed a, quite a bit of uh, variation, excellent control in the second year in Pullman with um, any treatment of Esplanade. Uh, anything else that didn't include the, um, Esplanade uh, returned to what I would call a sort of a status quo, highly inundated um, infestation of ventanata. At Moscow, we observed a somewhat more variable response where uh, the indazoplam treatments uh, didn't appear to be as effective, but were definitely better than anything else that didn't include uh, ventanata. And again, anything that didn't include the um, indazoplam was returning, returning to highly infested uh, ventanata status. Uh, at, in terms of biomass, 17 months after treatment, uh, we saw a significant release of the uh, perennial grasses present um, at the site, and that was primarily smooth brome and intermediate wheat grasses or typical CRP grasses. Uh, anything that included Esplanade, regardless of rate, released uh, that ventanata, released those perennial bunch grasses 
and uh, significantly reduce the, the vent out of biomass. <sighs> I apologize for the lack of resolution there on our uh, ordination. The ordination tells a rather interesting story. We were able to detect the two different sites using, um, using the ordination and also uh, that, that anytime you eliminated ventinata from the site, uh, both, uh, in both cases, there was a narrowing down and, and grouping of plots that had been released from ventinata. And there was a significant uh, correlation with an increase in smooth brome in terms of cover. Just a little bit different way to look at things in, in terms of uh, response. <clears throat> like Scott, I have lots of pictures. I actually don't have just a couple, uh, but <clears throat> Even in our small plots, this would be a non-treated control next to an endazoplam treated plot at 17 months after treatment, a significant release of the, uh, the perennial grass is present on the site. Uh, that led us to take uh, some of Derek's uh, methods and look at endazoplam um, dose, doses on the developing seedlings of the, the ventinata and uh, it appears to be Appears that ventinata is at least an order of magnitude more sensitive than downy brome to endazoplam. So we're getting um, effectively zero root growth at one nanomole concentrations, significant um, reduction. So, in conclusion, uh, Esplanade appears to be pretty effective for um, controlling ventinata at least two growing seasons, and I'm looking forward to going out this year and confirming that it probably does it for three. Um, I don't know that it necessarily matters in my uh, region when you apply this in dazoplam or vetinata control because it's so sensitive and it does a is fairly persistent in the environment. I think you're looking at multi-year um, control uh, regardless of when you make the application. And I think for a land manager, the decision is going to really come down to what exactly they want to have happen in the year they make the application. Do they want it nice and clean looking or can they wait until next spring to see results? Uh, and a lot of that will dictate what they choose to use in a, in a as a tank mix partner. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't make some, a few acknowledgements. Um, we have multiple people take a lot of these um, readings, particularly the cover and biomass uh, measurements, and also to uh, Bear Crop Science and, and Harry Quick for um, facilitating these studies. Thank you. Thanks. All right, our next speaker is Corey Ransom, and he is. Um, going to be presenting from his office here on campus at Utah State University. Um, I'm going to ask somebody to go up. Okay, Chris is up there. Just stop share. And then Corey will um, share his screen. Corey's going to talk to us about Medusa head and cheatgrass control. Um, and without further ado, go ahead and say something, Corey. Make sure we can hear you okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You got, can you guys hear there, Chris? Thumbs up. All right, go for it. Great, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing here in Utah uh, with Medusa head and cheatgrass management. And, uh, you know, I think that the point has been made here this morning that early management is really critical. And especially as we talk about a tool like Esplanade, we see that um, that tool has its utility when there's uh, desirable vegetation remaining in the understory. And, so if we wait until our sites look like this, which is Medusa head, uh, widespread, um, it's gonna be a little more difficult to move that back to a positive state. Just a little bit, if you're not familiar with Medusa head, of course, that seed head with the uh, long awns on the seeds that are twisted as they dry down is really characteristic. But those barbs on the seeds and the awns really facilitate the movement of this species from place to place. We think it moves a lot with wildlife and livestock, and so it's able to spread really well. And then just the picture down the right hand uh, corner showing the narrow leaves of a seedling of Medusa head in comparison to um, something like downy brome. I think it's really good to think about, you know, what are the different points in the life cycle of these annual grasses that we can target? And I think we can see that we have the opportunity to obviously prevent seed production has been discussed already. And also we have products that are really well at taking care of established plants and, and preventing them from going to seed. But the seed bank has been mentioned, uh, comes up uh, time and time again as being a critical factor. And I'll just show you some research that kind of demonstrates that. 
Um, just a list of some herbicides that are currently available, many of which have been talked about. And again, the use pattern of those herbicides will determine uh, their effect. And then for long-term control, we really need to be aware of what is the existing vegetation on the site and what is the site management potential or, or how is it being managed? And is this really an issue of protecting a site that still has uh, desirable vegetation remaining? Or is this uh, really a restoration effort? And that's gonna largely determine which herbicides we're gonna be using. So I wanna just talk about what we know or what we think we know, as somebody else mentioned. Um, maybe we don't know as much as we think. I'd like to talk just a little bit about our experience with application timing and how it influences herbicide effectiveness. Um, a little bit about can we combine uh, herbicides with other methods and, and control these invasive annual grasses and then really end with this idea of long-term change requires multiple treatments or extended control with herbicides. Application timing, uh, here's a, a late fall application timing on one of our Medusa head sites. And then here's what those seedlings uh, look like. So really important to know what is the stage of growth of those plants at the time we're making application. And if I was applying a pre-emergent herbicide, then this particular timing, obviously I would have missed the window because there are these established seedlings already. Some of the work that we've done have shown that if you apply a product like glyphosate or Mazepic, Roundup or Plateau, at the early boot or even the seed head emergent stage of growth, that we can reduce seed viability of those plants almost to zero. We've also done some work with milestone or aminopyrrolid and showed that if you apply that to uh, small plants in the spring, it really messes up the, the development of those seeds and basically also none of the seeds are viable from that particular um, cohort. But if you look the year later, what you notice is even though Roundup at the various rates reduce seed head uh, or seed viability, um, there's no evidence of control a year later. Whereas where we applied the plateau, we also uh, removed seed head or seed viability. But um, because plateau has a residual, we're seeing some control uh, year following treatment. And again, that's back to the seed bank, that if you don't manage the seed bank, it really doesn't matter if you take out one year of seed production. Um, you're going to have to do some multiple interventions there. We were having some trouble controlling Medusa head, and so we did a trial where we made various application timings, and we applied these different treatments in September, October, November, or April, and then our final application in May, May or June. And those treatments included things like Plateau and Matrix alone, Plateau and Matrix with Roundup and Roundup alone. And at each of these stages, we kind of took some cores to see what was happening to the Medusa head at each of these timings. I just want to quickly show you some results. So if we apply plateau, we see that as we, that as we move from a timing in September out to either November, or April, that control with plateau uh, really uh, increases and kind of disregard the May, June, because these are uh, evaluations taken only about a month after the treatments were applied and so they haven't had time to show effect. When we move on then to matrix, we notice that matrix didn't seem to be really dependent um, upon the application month. It did pretty good if, with any of the application timings. And then if we added Roundup to either of those two, we really didn't see an improvement. And I think it's interesting if you look at Roundup alone, what you see is that if you apply Roundup in September, you get only about 15% control, October the same. And then that control goes up significantly. And again, I think what we're talking about here is that there's continuous germination of the Medusa head across those months of time. And so uh, with Roundup not having any residual activity, whoops, not having residual activity, we're only gonna control the plants that are currently germinated. And so the later we wait, the better that control is. Another thing that might be uh, coming into play here is that if you look at the green lines, they show the, the tallest height of, of Medusa head plants at the different months. And the brown and orange line show the depth 
of the thatch of the Medusa head. And so again, as we wait until sometime around April, we finally get to a point where the Medusa head seedlings are taller than the thatch layer. And so there may be some issues here with retention of the herbicide or um, interception of the herbicide by the thatch. So just a nice image, you know, which timing is better to spray here when we can see the seedlings we're trying to control or when we're applying that herbicide directly to the thatch. Um, second uh, thing that we think we know is that we can definitely increase downy brome and, and I would presume Medusa head control with, by integrating with other methods. Trials I did in Eastern Oregon way back in the early 2000s showed that if you include fire with plateau herbicide, you can increase the control, probably related to uh, killing some of the seeds that are there in the thatch layer, as well as just opening the soil up so the herbicide uh, can make it to the soil better. Some additional work we did at, out at uh, Dinosaur National Monument from 2009 to 2015 um, looked at whether we could uh, do some large treatments aimed at seed reduction. So over here, uh, an untreated versus mowing at the red stage when the seed, seeds are produced but not viable, uh, but late enough that the plant can't produce new seed heads or applying with Roundup to, to uh, kind of reduce seed production. And then following that with herbicide. And what we found is that you can, yes, improve control by reducing the number of seeds produced and then applying a herbicide which has residual and these are what the plots look like. But what we saw as with many other of the speakers today is that that control is fairly short lived. And if we look at just the response of the vegetation with an application of plateau at 10 ounces, what we see is that the initial cover at one of our research sites was about 70, over 70% 70 downy brome at the initiation of the trial and less than 5% perennial grasses. When we applied the plateau, then what we're able to see is that uh, in 2011, our downy brome uh, cover goes down uh, to less than 10%. And we get this nice response of the desirable grasses up to over 50%. But then through time, you see as the residual of the herbicide, the residual effects wear off that downy brome begins to respond and increase again. And that competition causes desirable grass cover to decrease. And so four years later, you end up exactly where you started with about 70% downy brome cover and less than 5% desirable grass cover. So knowing that, we know that we have to have some other interventions. And so we know that long-term change requires multiple treatments or extending control with residual type herbicides. So we went back to some of the sites there at Dinosaur and we intervened with some large uh, treatments on some blocks. And what you see here again is that some of those were really effective and that uh, in the brown areas is where the downy brome was competing on these dry sites. And the nice lush green is the response of the desirable grasses when they're released from competition. The challenge again at these sites was we got a one year bump in a desirable grass response, but the following year when the downy brome reinvaded from the seed bank, uh, we see that the desirable grasses are then um, basically reduced to very little cover. So this leads me to some of the work uh, that we've had the opportunity to do with Esplanade, um, where we uh, looked at herbicides alone and combined with Esplanade on both Medusa head and downy brome. And we have some different application timings and some different sites. I'm just going to show you um, some of the data, uh, a small part, portion of the data from one of our sites. And here's what we see cover of downy brome versus crested wheatgrass, which was present at this site two years after treatment. And we see the untreated has um, almost 50% downy brome cover with less than 20% uh, crested wheatgrass cover. But when we release the competition uh, by controlling the downy brome, we see it those sites or those plots treated with Esplanade, we had zero uh, downy brome cover two years after treatment and the crested wheatgrass response has been uh, well over uh, double 
compared to the untreated. When we look at species biomass, this uh, response is even more um, significant. And we see that uh, we've gone from a little over 20 grams per 0.6 meter square meters to uh, almost 130 grams in that same area. And so a pretty amazing response in the crested wheatgrass, which was the desirable grass at our site. This just shows a picture of, of a different plot, but this is uh, an untreated plot this spring, just a couple of weeks ago. And this is two years after treatment. And here you can see a plot that's received Esplanade, lots of open space and, and a deeper green color of the grass as they're enjoying uh, growth with, with extra moisture and extra nutrients on that side. This is our Medusa head site uh, two years after treatment. And you can see the dense cover of Medusa head to the left and then the release of those perennial grasses to the right hand side. And this is late season. You can see that those perennial grasses when released from competition are able to produce a, a whole lot more biomass. So, you know, where do we go from here? Here are some things I think we still need to understand. What are the best settings? for the use of each herbicide approach. Obviously, if we have desirable understory, then uh, Esplanade looks like it's gonna do a really good job in releasing that understory, uh, those understory species. But if it's a re vegetation site, we're gonna need to use something that has uh, shorter residual so that we can get in there and, and reseed with some desirables. How can interspaces be maintained once an annual grasses are controlled? And then how do we use these tools to recapture highly degraded sites? This is a site where we're looking at native forb response. Yes, there is downy brome in amongst the canopy of this, but gives us a really great idea of any uh, potential impacts on that desirable vegetation from our various treatments. Here's a site that's three years after treatment. And what we're seeing now is that on this particular site, uh, field bindweed is moving in and becoming an issue. and so maybe some need for some follow-up treatments here. The question is, and I think the information we need to know is what constitutes uh, enough desirable vegetation on a site to come in with a treatment like Esplanade and lock out those annual grasses. This is obviously a really great uh, example of release of desirable vegetation versus here's a site where we treated uh, not with Esplanade but other treatments and controlled Medusa head but now we're left with a site that uh, has mostly filled bindweed, if anything else, desirable. And so when, when do we choose to use those various herbicides? And that's all I have. And I'll look forward to some questions during the question and answer session. Thanks, Corey. Um, next up, let's see, we have Tom Getz and um, I believe somebody's going to be pulling up his talk. He'll be doing his talk in person. Um, yeah, so we have a couple questions that have been accumulating in the Q&A uh, window. So feel free to keep putting them in there and we will get to them. Um, let's see, our next Q&A starts at 1210. So um, Gloria, you'll just need to share that screen up there. And just a reminder for our people tuning in online, um, if you're here for CEUs, I'll put the link in our chat window again. You can um, follow that link and that will allow you to receive CEUs for attending today. Um, there will also be a seven question poll at the end. Um, I'll administer that poll during the Q&A session. So if you wouldn't mind helping um, us evaluate our program and just take that poll, that will help us do a good job and continue to bring you informative webinars. And we can't hear you, Gloria, so. No, I'm trying to get his. Uh, oh, okay. Where's his PowerPoint? Yeah. Which one is it? Oh, yes. This guy right there. And then I tried to get a Zoom. Hold on, folks. No stage. worries. We're just fine. No problem. <laughs> we can hear you now, so. 
so we can't talk go. about it anymore. All right, yeah. well, we'll just go ahead and start talking while well, the presentation's getting pulled up. Uh, I'm Tom Getz, and I work for the University of California Cooperative Extension. I'm up in the Intermountain region. I'm based at a county office. And I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I've done with Medusa Head and Esplanade um, in the Intermountain region of California. So I don't have a whole lot of background information for you. As we've heard a lot of, about how these uh, species can have dramatic impacts on the environment um, from our previous speakers. But you know, one thing that I'd really like to point out with Medusa Head is that it certainly is a species that provides very poor forage for livestock and it is a silica accumulator. Um, you know, one of the numbers that was pulled up in uh, one of the previous presentations for Medusa head silica accumulation was about one and a half percent. And the number that I was more familiar with from some work done up in Idaho back in 2013 was about nine and a half to 12 percent. Um, so it certainly can accumulate a lot of that, which to my understanding really helps it um, have a very thick and persistent thatch layer, which really favors the germination and uh, persistence of the species. But with that, I'm going to jump right into some of the studies that I've done um, with Medusa Head. Uh, the green box on the screen um, indicates the region of California that I've been working in. And this, this map shows um, where Medusa Head populations are throughout the state. Um, so in California, there's a lot of Medusa head down in the Sierra foothills and in the coastal ranges, and those are more um, annual grass-based ecosystems. Where um, up in the Intermountain region where I, I did work is more of a perennial grass-based um, ecosystem. So I'm going to talk about a, a few different studies, uh, some pre-emergent treatments that I put out in the fall of 2016, um, a post-emergent trial um, that was put out in the fall of 2016, and then um, uh, a couple of trials put out in the spring of 2016 where reseeding was planned. And we've heard a lot about the different herbicides that are utilized to control these invasive annual grasses. Um, and, you know, one of the things that people keep talking about is Plateau or Mazapic. And this product actually isn't registered within uh, California and isn't, you know, available for people to utilize. Um, but I included it in the trials that I, I conducted, and I'm, I'll refer to it as either plateau or panoramic because I did include a, um, a generic. Um, what people typically use to control Medusa head, um, or what is available to use, is a matrix um, or Roundup. And uh, some of the work that, you know, and some of the questions that I was interested in answering was looking at um, specifically Esplanade uh, for control of Medusa head, as well as Milestone or Amino Pyrrolid. Um, there was quite a bit of work done down in the annual grasslands or in the foothills of California, um, looking at milestone applications, both as a pre-emergent treatment, as well as a treatment to the boot stage of Medusa head that looked um, very effective, but we weren't sure if those treatments were going to be effective in the Intermountain region. Uh, so first I'm going to walk you through a study uh, where we looked at some pre-emergent applications uh, that were put out in the fall of 2016. Uh, they were put out in September, and we didn't get any rain until October. Um, our climate is, in a way, similar to that, uh, what Ian described in Washington, where the vast majority of the rain comes from October to May, and we have a very dry um, summer period. So I'm just going to show you, uh, well, that didn't quite pop up, but I'm just going to show you results from one of the studies uh, east of Goose Lake um, up in Modoc, California. So this is a two months after treatment of November, in November of 2016, and these were pre-emergent applications, so two months after treatment. And we really weren't seeing a whole lot of control with um, our matrix treatments, our milestone treatments, or the um, uh, panoramic or mazapic treatment, where we were seeing uh, quite a bit of suppression where our esplanade, where esplanade or endazoflam was included. Um, by June of 2017, um, we did see a bit of an uptick in suppression with our other treatments and did see quite a bit of, or pretty good control from 80 to um, 90 percent where Esplanade was included. Uh, here's a picture of a milestone plot at 14 ounces where this in the annual rangelands was just a knockout treatment where at our study site we still have quite a bit of Medusa head intermixed with the perennial grasses. Um, likewise here's a picture of a plateau treatment or um, panoramic where again, you see quite a bit of Medusa head intermixed with the perennial grasses. 
or when you look at an espalonade treatment, you have quite a bit of bare ground here between the perennial bunch grasses, which is what you would um, you know, prefer to see. Uh, by November of 2017, that secondary germination cycle after the treatments were put out, um, you know, a decrease in control with many of our, uh, or with the milestone and panoramic treatments where we had um, excellent control um, in those esplanade treatments. Again, uh, here just showing the bare ground between the perennial bunch grasses. Um, by May of 2018 at this site, um, we continued to have pretty good control where uh, esplanade was mixed with method or uh, aminocyclopyrifluor, where interestingly, interestingly, where method was applied alone, we did have a, a bit of decrease or a bit of break of uh, the treatment, particularly at the, the five ounce rate. Um, so here's a picture of an untreated check from this May, where you can see just a dense stand of Medusa head. And on both sides of that treatment are plots that were treated with esplanade where we certainly were still seeing pretty good suppression of the Medusa head, but we did have a few plants um, coming into the plots. Uh, here's a graph uh, that shows the um, species cover um, by species class. And I'm gonna be showing you a few of these graphs for the various treatments. Um, so we have percent cover on the Y axis, and then the different colors indicate different um, species classes. So the yellow indicate annual grasses, the orange, perennial broadleafs, green, perennial grasses, blue, perennial broadleafs, and red indicates bare ground. And where we reduced the um, annual grass with the Medusa head, we did have a little bit of a bump in bare ground as well as a bump in the perennial grass cover. Next, I'm gonna walk you through a study where we put out some post-emergent treatments um, at a site where we're looking at whether or not um, esplanade um, would work alone or with a burn down treatment compared to, you know, the standards of matrix or plateau. And I threw milestone in the mix uh, just to see what would happen. Um, these were put out in November of 2017 and the Medusa head was anywhere from two to 10 centimeters tall. It was a very uh, productive Medusa head site with really thick litter layer. And you can see just a little bit of green starting to come up in these in the, at the site. Um, by June of 2017, so the following year, we had a, uh, you know, fair suppression with our milestone at 14 ounces, uh, matrix, as well as plateau. Um, pretty good suppression, you know, bordering on control with esplanade alone, um, which is interesting because that was applied post-emergent, um, you know, about a month after the seedlings came up. Whereas when esplanade was mixed with a burn down product, we had excellent control. Uh, Here's a picture of an untreated check in June of 2017, just a thick um, mat of Medusa head. Um, milestone at 14 ounces looks pretty similar, a little bit of bare ground in there. Um, matrix at four ounces certainly provided pretty good suppression, but we have quite a bit of plants in there that are putting on seed heads. Um, same with Plateau, again, better suppression than the Matrix uh, plot, but still quite a bit of Medusa head in there that's putting on seed heads. Where uh, Esplanade alone, there was just a couple of uh, Medusa head plants coming up, um, where with that burn down treatment, uh, the green that you see in there is a California dandelion, which is a perennial species. But at this site, we did not have the remnant plant community that you would like. And you know we were essentially left with bare ground at this time point, or litter, not bare ground. Uh, by November of 2017, um, had a decrease in the effectiveness of uh, all of our treatments that did not include esplanade, where uh, esplanade alone uh, bumped up in control. Again, here's a, a picture from November of 2017, uh, just looking at the you know litter that was left behind from the Medusa head from the previous growing season. Uh, by May of 2018, this year, we uh, you know essentially were seeing very little control in our treatments that did not include esplanade. And pretty good control where, or very good control where Esplanade was applied as a singular product. And I can't really explain this, but a little bit of a decrease um, in control where it was included with a, a burn down product. But given this is just one site and one trial. A uh, picture of an untreated check from this May. Um, a plateau treatment where we're seeing a, a bit of suppression, but some very vigorous, healthy um, Medusa head plants growing in there. And 
this was really kind of a, a conundrum to me and I didn't really understand it. This was an Esplanade plus a matrix plot um, where most of the, the other three replications of this study looked very clean, whereas in this replication, we certainly were having some breaks of a Medusa head in the, in the front half of the plot. Um, so we, we weren't seeing, you know, perfect control by, by any means. Whereas uh, Esplanade is a singular product and a little bit drier portion of the study was a, a very clean plot with just a couple of plants coming through and um, also some Mediterranean sage or another non-desirable species colonizing that bare ground. Um, which leads me to, you know, the, the species cover or the bare ground, which I've mentioned a, a little bit where, you know, we reduced those annual grasses. We had a tremendous increase in bare ground at this uh, study site. Uh, which gets me to some of the spring trials that we put out where the goal was to treat the Medusa head and then come back and revegetate because many of the areas where the Medusa head is growing in our region, it is monocultures and there are not a lot of desirable um, remnant perennial species and it's really important to be able to establish something for um, fire breaks as we've talked about how important um, that can be. So these treatments were applied um, in mid-March of 2017. And we included Roundup in the tank or in mid-March of 2016. And we uh, included Roundup in the tank for all of our treatments, essentially give us a blank slate um, so that we could come back and drill seed into these uh, areas. So we had two different study sites, um, one with a really thick litter layer outside of Aden, California, and one with a thinner litter layer um, just next to Goose Lake um, up on the Oregon border. And I'm just going to show you results from the Aiden trial, although they were pretty similar between the two sites. Um, in terms of control, in April of 2016, we had pretty good control a couple or a month after treatment with most of our treatments, but not that blank slate that we were looking for. Um, we had quite a bit of Medusa head actually that had survived that glyphosate application in the tank mix and was going to come up and probably put on seed. So we came through with another application of glyphosate in April of um, 2016 to control that Medusa head so that we could start with that blank slate. Um, this is a graph showing the percent control of June of 2016 where, you know, essentially there was no uh, Medusa head uh, growing on the site. By November of 2016, that first germination cycle um, after the treatments were made, um, we were seeing excellent control in the plots that uh, included in Dazaflam, um, really good control in the uh, panoramic or Mazapic plots, and then suppression where milestone at that 14 ounce rate or method had been applied. Uh, here's a picture of the site. Again, there were not any remnant perennial uh, grasses at this site. And uh, when I say bare ground, um, where there was litter um, is what I was assessing is bare ground. Uh, I was only assessing living cover um, for the different species classes. But in November, so uh, by April of uh, 2017, uh, continued to have excellent control in our Esplanade treatments, um, good control in the Amazapic treatments with uh, suppression in those milestone and method treatments. Uh, the untreated check in uh, April of 2017, just a beautiful mat of Medusa head. A milestone at 14 ounces, certainly showing suppression of the Medusa head with some, uh, you know, bare ground in there, but a lot growing, um, similar to a treatment of a method. A panoramic at 12 ounces or the Amazepic plot, um, you know, pretty good control, but certainly a few Medusa head plants um, coming in. And Esplanade by itself, uh, you know, essentially providing bare ground at this time point, which is good since the seeding was planned. So we would have liked to come in and seed earlier, um, but we had a historically wet winter and we weren't able to get on the ground until May of 2017, um, where we came through and we seeded eight perennial grasses, um, five native and three introduced. And unfortunately, by the time we got on the ground, it was a really clay soil and we didn't receive any more significant pre uh, precipitation. Um, by October of 2017, uh, most of our treatments had broken except the Esplanade treatments where we were still continuing to get control um, with a bit of suppression in the panoramic treatment. And plenty of bare ground if we would have gotten moisture for those seedlings 
to come up, which uh, didn't happen, unfortunately. Uh, well, we had we had one or two seedlings come up throughout throughout the plot. Um, you know, this is a gr uh, chart that shows the total plants per plot um, in the fall of 2017. And essentially, you know, we had anywhere from one to 15 plants, you know, in the entire plot. So we really were just seeing bare ground out there. So we came through and we reseeded this April in uh, 2018. Um, the same grasses in the in the same areas, um, and we have seen some rainfall since. Um, in terms of control, this May we continued to uh, see a little bit of suppression with the panoramic treatment, where most of the other treatments looked like the untreated control. Um, besides the treatments that included um, in dazaflam. Uh, here's a picture of a milestone treatment that looks very similar to an untreated check. Um, here's a Esplanade plus method treatment. Um, this was one of the replications where we did see a little bit of a break um, right in the middle of the plot, but still pretty acceptable control. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of bare ground um, at this study site. So hopefully some of those perennial grasses will come through. I think I'm running out of time. Um, but with that reseeding effort that we did in April of 2018, it hasn't been evaluated yet, but we've certainly gotten um, quite a bit of precipitation on it. And we have seen germination of intermediate wheat grass, um, Russian wild rye, the Great Basin wild rye, and a few of the other species. Um, so I'm excited to see what sort of establishment we can get in that bare ground, because it's certainly a very important um, you know, in areas where you have monocultures, to be able to control the plants and come back and actually get something desirable established because many of our rangelands in uh, the Intermountain region of California do not have that perennial grass component. Um, and with that in, in conclusion, you know, looking at milestone as a treatment for the Intermountain region, we weren't seeing the success that they were seeing with it um, down in the annual uh, rangelands. Um, we didn't see really good control with matrix. The results were inconsistent between our trials where um, plateau and panoramic certainly offered good suppression, but again, isn't available to the people in uh, California. And I think for Esplanade to work, just to reiterate what many of the other people have said, it's really important to have that um, established desirable perennial um, unless you have uh, plans to come back and do some sort of revegetation effort. And that, that's all I got for you. So <clears throat> that concludes the presentation of a lot of our uh, uh, scientific research. And to provide a quick wrap up and a summary is Dr. Harry Quick there. Uh, I don't know what the name stands for. Vegetation management. Vegetation. Their vegetation management stewardship and development team. Uh, and do you have a? Uh... No, I don't have a PowerPoint. Okay. So there won't be a PowerPoint, so we get to listen to a wrap up, and then we'll have a quick question and answer session. Thanks, Richard. As Gloria said, I'm Harry Quick, the Western Region Stewardship and Development Manager for Bayer. Started working with Bayer about three years ago, and one of the most exciting projects I'm involved in is. Uh, taking the work that started at Colorado State University on Esplanade for controlling cheatgrass, taking that work to the rest of the Western United States, working with universities uh, across the West and looking at multiple different annual grasses. And it's really nice to see some of the uh, very encouraging uh, results that we, we're getting from uh, studies working with multiple different uh, stakeholders. So my job is to just wrap up and give a summary. I'd firstly like to thank Gloria and Megan and also Colorado State University for helping to facilitate this webinar. And then also all the speakers. Uh, we had speakers from multiple agencies uh, from multiple different states across the West looking at many different annual grass species and an excellent, just an excellent set of presentations. So thank you for everybody uh, that presented online or in the uh, meeting room here at Colorado State University. 
So I wanted to just give a couple of highlights uh, from each speaker, very, very uh, short uh, highlights that I uh, wrote down. So, you know, Matt Gemino mentioned a half million acres of sagebrush step that are mm -hmm. impacted, severely impacted by invasive grasses. And then uh, Matthew Brooks talked about uh, black brush scrub uh, dominated by Broma species, which can be eliminated by a single wildfire. Which, uh, so that's a very serious impact uh, from uh, very little uh, disturbance. Uh, Roy Everill Murray, of course, covered in detail the impacts of annual invasive grasses on desert tortoise, which is a threatened species. And also the impacts of, on the Joshua tree with those fires coming into these uh, Mojave Desert uh, regions, which uh, aren't or don't have a history of of wildfire and uh, the wildfires just having significant impacts and of course the wildfires are fueled by the annual invasive grass uh, fuels. Uh, Lindy Garner did an excellent job of covering the sagebrush ecosystem and the multiple different groups of species that are impacted. Uh, you know, Lindy mentioned 350 different species are dependent on the sagebrush uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, the pygmy rabbit, uh, sage grouse, of course, uh, which is the most well known, uh, but also songbirds, ants, beetles, and gra grasshoppers, reptiles, small mammals, and arthropods, all potentially impacted severely by these annual invasive grasses. Uh, Shannon Clark covered uh, the, uh, started to cover the impacts of Espinard. Uh, also mentioning 54 million acres impacted by cheatgrass across uh, the USA. And also, you know, Shannon showed some uh, of the early results uh, showing increases in forb cover after espinard treatments, uh, increases in species richness, and also increases in perennial grass biomass. And Derek Sebastian started to focus in on espinard. For those of you that may be wondering the term endazaflam has been used and the term espinard kind of interchangeably. Endazaflam is the active ingredient in espinard. So key that, that Derek mentioned that is a pre-emergence herbicide, that means to have an impact that needs to be applied before germination. So if we're applying after germination, you need another component to help control what has already emerged. And uh, Derek also talked about the reason why espinard is selective on perennials, and it's because of the position of the espinard and the soil profile. It stays right near the very top surface layer of the soil. It's tightly bound to soil particles. So if you have perennial species with roots below, uh, you're deeper in the soil, uh, then it's not impacted. Uh, Scott Nissen uh, talked about the early research at Colorado State University, which started in 2010. So, yeah, this research has now been going on for eight years. Also showed uh, per, uh, the positive impacts of Espinard on uh, native perennials. And then Ian Burke did one of the very first studies looking at Espinard on Ventanada together with Tim Prather had a similar study. And for the first time, we saw that and documented that Espinard is really effective at uh, controlling Ventanada. And then, uh, you know, those studies also showed the really fast response of the perennial grasses when you remove that annual grass competition. It's always impressive. You can stand looking at these plots for hours and not get tired of looking at them. Yeah, you know, the perennial grass responses are just uh, really, really impressive in many cases. And then uh, finally, but not least, uh, Tom Getz been working on Medusa head control in uh, higher elevation sites of California. You know, showing uh, that Espinard again is quite efficacious in those systems. And then Tom also showed that, you know, many of these sites in California, Central uh, Valley, you know, is particularly uh, uh, problematic in that many of these sites are now just dominated with annual grasses. And so if you control all the annual grasses, you will get bare ground. 
Uh, there's many areas in the Great Basin like this as well, you know, dominated by cheatgrass, cheatgrass monocultures. So I want to stress that our recommendation is we need to start on areas that have remnant populations of perennial species, because you know, if we can release that, that's relatively easy, relatively inexpensive uh, to do. When you get to restoration, where you have to start reseeding, reestablishing perennial species, that's a very difficult process. It doesn't always work. It's highly dependent on uh, timely rainfall because you know, much of the West is very, very low rainfall. Much easier if we protect what we have and focus on recovering sites that still have remnant populations to be released. So I think that's a one key uh, takeaway message. So with that, uh, there are a few questions. So um, I got keyed in on a couple of questions that I'll address to start off with. And one, one of the questions is a very common one. Uh, and that is, what is the impact of Espinard on wildlife species? So the answer is uh, Espinard, like other herbicides, undergoes an extremely extensive set of testing prior to registration. And the testing includes a whole suite of different wildlife species. So for example, the impacts are, are tested on fish, on birds, on mammals, on aquatic invertebrates, on earthworms, you know, just examples, a whole a suite of different tests. And uh, all of these tests have to occur before the herbicide can be labeled uh, for the use patterns that it's labeled for. So the answer to the question, what is the impact of Espinard on wildlife species? And this would be just be the direct impact uh, of herbicide you know, toxicity. Uh, the answer is there is no concern uh, when used according to label directions, of course. Uh, you always have to throw that in there. Uh, so that takes care of uh, you know, the wildlife aspect. And then the question is, okay, we don't have a grazing tolerance, so are there concerns with, uh, wild, with livestock grazing in espinard treated areas? So to get a grazing tolerance, which will allow livestock to graze, there's a whole suite of tests that have to be conducted. Uh, they're a very expensive set of tests. And uh, Bayer is currently doing all, those, all that testing. You know, there's uh, residue tests to find out how much residue is left on, on species that will be grazed by livestock. And then milk and meat studies have to be conducted to make sure there's no concern with those products entering you know, the human food stream. And so we, we fully expect to do the submission to the EPA by the end of this year. And then the EPA has a long review period. So, you know, we would expect to have a grazing tolerance uh, within a few years, which would allow grazing by livestock. And the grazing tolerance means that there is no restriction. You can graze immediately after the application. So in the meanwhile, we have this uh, tremendous threat of Ventanada and Medusa head moving east. And you know, the front line of states now is Montana, Wyoming, and Utah. And so Wyoming was the first state to say, you know, Espinard has shown to work extremely well on these species, very concerned about the economic impacts of these species moving into you know, Wyoming and then potentially into the rest of the uh, Great Plains area where you know, they don't exist at this time. And so they made an application to the EPA for an emergency exemption to allow uh, Espinard to be used on areas grazed by livestock. So the EPA granted that exemption first to five counties and then later extended it to the whole state of Utah. And Bayer was able to provide the EPA with enough information to make them satisfied that if you withheld grazing for two weeks, then uh, cattle could graze and there were no uh, concerns about that uh, grazing. So there's a two week grazing restriction there. Following that, Montana, 
and Utah have also uh, submitted for those emergency exemptions. So I think that covers the wildlife and the, uh, the grazing side of it. Uh, the other question that came up and one that often we often get, so Espinard is a uh, pre-emergence product, so how, how would it impact uh, native species trying to recruit uh, with uh, seed grain? And uh, so uh, we don't have uh, much information on the impact of native perennial species and how successfully they may germinate uh, after an Espinard application, but we can assume there is going to be an effect because Espinard is a very good uh, pre-emergence product. Uh, so when I talk to rangeland managers, uh, they tell me that a recruitment from seed in a perennial grass system uh, occurs on a very, very irregular basis. You may be talking, you know, 10 to 20 years, every 10 to 20 years, where you actually have a successful uh, recruitment event of native perennial grasses through uh, seed rain. And uh, so, so, you know, that makes it somewhat um, less of a, a concern. Uh, and then we must also kind of think about the fact that in these heavily invaded annual grass systems, it's highly likely you're not getting any recruitment from seed rain anyway, because you know those annual grasses are going to outcompete natives trying to reseed uh, in that area. So uh, you know we just have to keep those uh, questions in mind. We are planning to do a study to look at the relative tolerance of some of the native <laughs> perennial species versus the annual grasses to Espinard. Uh, I think that'll be very interesting uh, when we do uh, that uh, study. So with that, I'm going to hold, uh, hand over to Gloria to uh, facilitate the rest of the question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. That's great. I'm going to ask all of our online speakers to unmute themselves and turn their video on because we have a couple questions. Um, and I received one via email, so I'm going to read it and then um, ask um, some folks to chime in. So, it's right here. So, can everybody hear me okay, Gloria? Yep. Okay, no, good. Didn't. At the 2017 um, Society of Rangeland Management, I remember a presentation concerning the reduction of perennial grasses in the openings between shrubs on sagebrush sites. Subsequent fires resulted in high mortality of remaining grasses because most were located under the protective cover, protected from grazing of sagebrush. During the burn, temperatures were elevated under the sage due to the extended burn of the woody material. This seems to indicate that we can prime an area for an undesirable response to fire by reducing perennial grasses between sagebrush plants, most often a result of livestock grazing. So Matt responded to me and I'm gonna ask him to sort of chime in and maybe read his response and if you feel like expanding on it, awesome. Um, and maybe anybody else wants to, to chime in as well. Yeah, this is a really great point that has been raised um, and it's, Part of. Uh, I just gotta. Sorry, there you are. Okay. We're looking at your oh, midsection. <laughs> uh, so this relates to what we had Matt, emphasized. Excuse me, Matt. Can you hold your microphone much closer? We can't hear you very well. Oh, your our finger's probably over it. There you go. Perfect. So this relates to our assessment of um, pre-treatment vegetation conditions. Yes, um, this is a major issue. Um, one thing that can be done to rectify the situation is to try to, um, and this is fairly expensive to do, but to try to establish bunch grasses in those bare soil interspaces between the sagebrush plants. Um, the same concept actually probably holds in other ecosystem types where you have uh, coexistence of the woody species along with uh, bunch grasses. Um, unfortunately, establishing bunch grasses 
um, outside of severely disturbed systems like fire where you're, you're offered a very fresh burnt template to work with where you can use like laser and drills and things like that. But when you don't have that kind of template, it's pretty challenging to have successful uh, <laughs> people have tried like planting um, bunch grass plants in between, in between sagebrushes as a way to get around this. But I think the point of the comment is that um, that grazing management um, does matter um, in terms of poisoning system to be able to recover from the disturbance. Thanks, Matt. Um, I muted our other speakers just to sort of minimize feedback because um, we were having sort of a hard time hearing Matt Germino. Um, Gloria, do you want to take a question or, or read a question or two? Yeah, uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, there's two questions uh, for Derek and Dr. Quick. Um, can you get Esplanade online or farm supply stores? Uh, and is it available for purchase and use by the general public? Yeah, so you have to have a um, current applicator's license and you can purchase it through distributors such as Helena Van Beast, CPS. Um, so you have to go through that and the product would be Esplanade 200 SC for this uh, non-crop natural areas open space. Okay, and uh, which Esplanade type that you named would be best for a sagebrush for sagebrush perennial grass area? That would be the Esplanade 200 SC. Okay, easy peasy. Um, Here, we would only need a private applicator. Hold, hold on, we have feedback. Sorry. Uh, Scott, this is here. I think I just wanted to add to Derek's question. Um, it's not restricted use, so you really wouldn't need like a commercial license or anything like that. You just you can have the uh, private applicator's license, which is pretty easy. So any 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 landowner, I don't even know why you couldn't purchase it as a just a small landowner without an applicator. Shannon, you, Shana, you might know. You don't need a commercial that. account though. Oh, it's just because you need a commercial. Yes. Okay. Is that on eBay, Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you need a commercial account. Yeah, and then purchase through distribution. Yeah. Which private landowners can obtain if they if they get the right paperwork and licenses. Okay. And uh, one person says I'm interested in the research that is being performed on the impact of Esplanade on native species. I think Dr. Quick is working on addressing that. It was mentioned there's recent focus on forb impacts. Is there any focus on this research on the difference between impacts on annual forms versus perennial forms? So yeah, this is uh, very quick. That's a you know very good uh, question. Uh, we do not have any research that's focused on uh, annual native forms. Uh, you know, we do control a lot of uh, broadleaf species from seed. Uh, so certainly perennial forms. Are you know if they don't march, uh, for you know they're going to be tolerant. All, all in fact, we haven't found any perennial form uh, to be uh, negatively impacted by uh, Esplanade at this at this point. So being a pre-emergent herbicide, there is potential that it could stop germination of uh, annual forms. Uh, so. Um, Yes, but uh, you know, that's something that would still have to be investigated okay. in more detail. Oh, yeah, so that's, that's, at this point, you don't know of any negative effects on the annual forms, but... Well, no, no negative effects on perennial forms perennial. that are you know, uh, established at the time of application. Right. Um, but more fact, research needs to be done. In fact, uh, you know, we see in the opposite on you know, uh, uh, perennial, established perennial forms and grasses uh, in that we increase uh, the diversity and abundance after the application. So just positive impacts. Uh, okay. So uh, the next question I think is, uh, there's another question about poa and stuka mm -hmm. species. Uh, these are perennial grass species. They are known to uh, be impacted by Esplanade. Uh, we, we don't have any substantial testing on established Vestuca and Poa species in range type settings at this time. 
the suggestion would be to proceed extremely cautiously if these are dominant desirable species on your site. Uh, there could potentially be negative impacts from Esplanade on these uh, uh, genera. Uh, we are starting a series of studies in Western Montana, working with US Forest Service uh, to evaluate Esplanade on Idaho fescue, for example. And uh, those studies will be installed starting this fall. So those are two uh, groups to be to be concerned about and to be careful and don't do any large scale applications at this time if those are dominant desirable species. Okay. And while you have the microphone, this next question is also probably for you. Does Esplanade have any residual effect in later years? Uh, so we need to think about what we mean by residual effect. So residual in terms of continuing to control annual invasive grasses, yes, we've seen that. Uh, you know, we've seen three to four years of control of, of teak grass. Um, you know, we first ventanada studies on two years and Medusa had studies you know, two years old going on three, and we see seeing continuing uh, residual control. And the concern uh, that is sometimes raised is as Esplanade slowly move down in the soil profile, reach lower soil levels, and thereby start to impact perennial species with uh, root systems lower in the soil surface at you know, later, in later years. And the answer is no, there's no chance of that happening. The Esplanade is very tightly bound to soil particles and it remains very near the surface. We're talking like the top inch of the soil surface. It's where the esplanade stays. So there are some metabolites that will move down into lower soil profiles. The concentration of those metabolites and their relative phytotoxicity, relative to the phytotoxicity of esplanade means there is no chance that metabolites moving down layer in the soil profile will impact uh, established perennial species. Okay, uh, we have one other question here. We'll just go through, um, make sure that we have all the online questions and then can open it up for uh, other questions from the group here. Um, we have, well, it's 12.30, um, but we can continue for a few more minutes, I suppose. Um, my neighbors and I spray pre-emergent to control annuals. Every year they use stronger, uh, they use the chemicals rec recommended by the county weed control program. Um, these are getting stronger and stronger herbicidal pre-emergence. What's the best one to, to use to control these annuals without harming the native sagebrush, planted trees and other perennial grasses? Uh, pendulum was too strong. What is the current recommendation for annuals? I guess I'll take this one. Uh, this is <laughs> Shannon Clark again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've talked about Esplanade a lot today, and it's, um, and I've done a lot of native tolerance work throughout my PhD, um, and Esplanade would be a really great choice. Uh, if you have land that's not grazed, um, maybe just a small property or, or something that's not currently being used for grazing, um, and that would be fine for sagebrush, trees, and perennial grasses all alike. So um, I recommend that. Um, looks like they've used panoramic and plateau. I mean, that's another option, especially if it's on a grazed property. Um, pendimethylin is used a lot as a pre-emergent, but it can be a harsher herbicide. Um, so I think I would recommend panoramic or plateau panoramic on grazed sites and Esplanade if you have an ungrazed area. Okay. Yeah, this is there. I'll just add one thing. So the in terms of they're getting stronger and stronger, the herbicides, the ones that were mentioned, the panoramic and the pendulum, they have post-emergence activity. So that's where you're getting that phytotoxicity. So that's why what Shan said, based on the position of Esplanade, it's not that it's, I guess, a weaker herbicide. It's just the position of the herbicide over that longer term period, as opposed to some of the others okay. that have post-activity. Okay. Uh, does anybody else in the group, oh, we have just a couple more minutes. Have any specific questions they'd like to address for the greater good? Uh, Lindy, let's see. 
Lindy had a thought in here. So to follow up on previous questions, how long is recommendation to wait before a seeding effort after use of endazoflam is seeding, if seeding is needed? Yeah, Lindy. That's a great question. And we, you know, we're doing more and more studies throughout the West. That's definitely the area that we need to have more research and um, targeted studies based on, like I said, the variability in sites, moisture, like Tom had the really, really dense batch layers. And so depending on these different soil moisture, soil regimes, that's definitely where we need to target. We've had some really good success. Here in Colorado, we did a March application timing of Esplanade plus glyphosate, and we came back and drill seeded that winter. So a nine month plant back, and we had uh, you know a really good moisture year that year, and we had really good establishment that next spring. So that was a nine month plant back. Right now we're recommending at least a nine month plant back into Esplanade, but more research needs to be done. Okay. All right. Scott's got something. Uh, he probably just wants to tell him it should be drill seed. Right? Yes, and drill in, and with any revetch, you know, project, drill seeding is gonna be more successful than your broadcast seeding. So we recommend drill seeding through the Esplanade. And we have uh, two presenters with comments or questions, uh, Tom Getz. Yeah, just a quick uh, question that actually came to me on my phone. I was wondering if this webinar is going to be available for people that weren't able to see it today and whether or not PowerPoint presentations from presenters are going to be made available to the public. Yeah, it's being recorded. Uh, it's As we speak, it's, it's still recorded. Uh, and I believe uh, Zoom will, I, I believe either they'll chop it up into four sections and deliver it to you because four, three or four hours is too long. So they'll, they'll segment it out and send it to Megan, right? Yeah, it'll be on our website, um, forestry.usu.edu, and then we'll host it on YouTube. So feel free to share it and um, link to it from wherever you are. And um, if you joined our mailing list, um, you'll get an email uh, probably in the next week or two when it gets put up there. So um, just stay tuned. And we'll post it to the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network YouTube as well. So um, just something to chime in. If you're still um, joining us online and you haven't taken the online survey, please do so uh, just really quick. Uh, we have one more question, comment. I wish we had named our pounds. Uh, this is Jim Burke. Actually, I have a question for you, Shan. But it's dying from the season. And for context, uh, my systems, particularly fallow wheat rotation in central Washington, uh, growers have had a grower mention of the seed bank last for decades. And I noticed you really didn't discuss the timing. So just so everybody can hear, the question is, please discuss how climate and temperature affects the long-term sea bed. Go ahead, Yeah, um, so I would say that is something that we need a lot more research on. So ours is really Colorado specific, um, the seed bank study here. And um, that's what the results that we found. Um, but right now, Dan Tegla in Wyoming is conducting a lot of that research where he's looking at um, different elevations, different moisture regimes, um, different climates, to see what the longevity is in those areas on the downy grown seed to see if it's still that kind of one to three year germination period or if it persists longer than the seed bank, like you mentioned. Um, so I think we just need more of that research across the West to cover the different, I mean, we have so many different ecosystem moisture regimes. Um, so it's hard to answer that question until the research is done. That's a great point. Well, and when we were doing the literature review for this paper that we put together, it was the only ones that we cited were able to cite and find was from the 70 you know, the seed bank work. So there needs to be more to be done. And then, and then what they say is that 99% of the seed germinates in year one, and then you get the 1%. I think you get a lot, you get quite a bit more germination in year two and three than we think. Than what I've seen. Scott wants to make a point too. One of the problems I think we get into is when we discuss seed bank. So we have hundreds of millions of seed per acre, and we have 99% production. We still have millions of seed per acre. And uh, it takes a long time, a long, longer perhaps, to erode that seed. Bank. Yeah, 
Gloria, can you repeat that? Sorry, what he just said. Yeah, just say. I'll try and repeat it again. Yeah, there you go. But so much closer. I apologize. So uh, one of the trouble, one of the biggest problems I have with talking about seed banks in terms of percent is that we often encounter seed banks on an acre basis that are um, on the order of millions of seeds per acre, and sometimes hundreds of millions of seeds. So when we talk about a 99% reduction in seed bank, there's still millions of seed per acre. And uh, it's something I think we need to make sure that everyone understands just the magnitude of the problem. All right, just a, a couple more, and then we should probably wind okay, up. This is Scott Nissany, and I, one thing I wanted to mention is I wonder if um, tillage operations didn't have a you know, cult, cultivated situation distributing the seed over a much longer pro, uh, distance in the profile, whereas these um, natural areas, all the seed is sitting right at the soil surface. That could have a big impact. Oh. I would also say that one of the most uh, comprehensive studies done on seed blood longevity of the variety of wheat seeds was done by Orton Burnside at the uh, University of Nebraska. And even in their long term burial study, cheatgrass only had um, probably, I think, four years, was, it was four to five years was the max they found for um, the residual life of downy grown seed in the soil. And that was a study that was conducted over almost 20 years. So they buried samples and pulled, up, pulled them up once every year for the first couple of years, and then on a three or four year basis after that. And, and they came up with the same, same number. So I'm wondering if it doesn't have something to do with cultivation. Distributing those seeds through a, a fairly significant uh, part of the soil profile. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're free to uh, go on with discussion here. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for pulling this together. Um, Derek, uh, come on up here so you can you can be in the camera. Derek really did a lot, a lot of work. You'll have to stoop down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Derek did a massive amount of work uh, seeking out speakers and confirming and bringing some people in. And uh, really, a lot of the logistics stuff went to Derek. Uh, and Megan really helped to pull a lot of this together. We'd like to thank you all for being here and all the online folks. Um, you're welcome to email uh, any of the speakers or contact Megan or myself with any questions or further products. And those of you who will be coming to the field tour tomorrow, we'll see you then. Um, Derek, do you wanna talk about uh, anybody who is online? who will be meeting us tomorrow and just go over those details for those people who are still on. Yeah, yeah, so we'll be meeting on uh, I-25 in Loveland at the Embassy Suites, parking lot on the east side of the Embassy Suites. So we'll uh, meet there in the morning. We'll have, um, get everybody lined up to get on the shuttles. We'll have some trucks to carpool. And then we will head to Longmont to look at three different locations of, of sites. So looking okay. forward to the, the tour. Okay, have a great day tomorrow, guys. Yeah, we'll be thinking of you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Megan. And no I problem. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for tuning in from wherever you were and uh, appreciate it. Okay, thank you all to all presenters. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye.